Hello everyone, this is General Haggerty. Welcome to my war room in Prince George, British Columbia. In today's video, we will be continuing in our series on this demonstration game of Global War 1914. The game will be out very soon. So the next in the turn order is Italy. However, Italy is not in the war yet, so what you do in this case is you just skip over Italy. Uh, you don't collect any money for them. You don't move any units around. I mean, how would you? You don't know what side they're going to be on, right? So who would spend that money, right? Um, that would be a bit of a fight. No, no, let's buy this. No, no, let's buy that. <laughs> so anyway, you can't play Italy. So uh, it's not until, I believe it's summer 1915 that they join. There, there's still two or three turns left. So it goes to the next nation in the turn order, which is... Japan. Now, this is not the Empire of the Rising Sun Japan. This is World War One Japan. Uh, but before we get to Japan, I just want to do some housekeeping. And I'm really glad about this. There are people that are letting me know, oh, you made this little uh, mistake here, or asking questions, um, and uh, is that supposed to happen? And I'm really glad that's happening because there is a couple of housekeeping items I have to do after yesterday's video. Uh, the first one came uh, from my partner developing this game, and that's Bob. So <laughs> I took uh, an infantry and an artillery from here to here because it looks like they're adjacent. But if you look really closely, here, let's zoom that in. If you look really closely there, you can see that they're not adjacent okay so uh we, we're gonna have to change that they can only go one space uh, of course and so they're gonna go over here to northern belarusia like i could go there or i could go to estonia uh that gets me closer but this gives me more options if i went to estonia then the only place i could go from there is latvia to get closer to the line whereas if i go here i can go to Latvia, or I can go to where those uh, Cossacks are right now. Anyway, so that's what I've done. I'm gonna keep it zoomed in because there's another thing I wanna show you. So the other thing that came in was a comment on this, on the Russian video, and it asked, was I able to place the infantry in Serbia since, uh, like, uh, do I need a supply path? And I kind of thought there was a supply path, but there actually wasn't. So good eye. Uh, that was a good catch. And this is actually, I'm glad this happened because it's a, a teachable moment. Um, there's some things that are different about this game that are not the same in the 36 game. And one of them is the diplomacy rules. I haven't reached the diplomacy level to do this yet, but it's it gives me an opportunity to talk about it. First of all, though, let me just show you something else. Uh, when I took the Austro-Hungarian turn, I'm surprised that nobody asked me about this because I forgot to say something, but um, nobody did ask me. So uh, they asked me, was I able to collect the money? Or no, um, uh, the thing is, uh, the question is, am I able to collect the money from Bulgaria for Austria? Uh, because you need to be able to trace a supply path to Austria in order to collect that, right? Uh, the thing is, I could do that because I could go out of this, um, this naval base here and I could go around Greece, right? And then you see there's two submarines there. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. And then there's the Adriatic uh, right here, this line here. Sorry, I'm just looking at that. So that isn't closed yet because Italy is not, um, Italy is not at war. So they don't prevent people from going through there. Not until they're at war and then they can prevent their enemies if they want to, which of course they would. So um, they can get th they can get over that line and they can get through these subs because a supply path is not the same as a land lease path. I mean, they're almost the same. They work almost exactly the same, but it's not exactly the same. One of the things that's different is that uh, if this was land lease that I was sending, 
then both of those subs would get an opportunity to interdict that, right? Uh, but with a supply path, the only thing that's going to stop them as far as ship goes is a blockade. Whether you blockade a port or you blockade the only sea zone um, that you can get through to get there. And this would be a case of that. You could not get to Austria by water without going through this sea zone. So if you had three warships there, then that would also prevent that from happening. Okay, but now we're talking though about uh, Serbia. So Serbia is obviously landlocked there, right? Uh, we're looking here, it's that purple territory there. And they have got to get up to Russia there. Now I kind of thought that I could do it, right? Because of, uh, the, there's two different things. So when you when it comes to the neutral countries in here, there's a progression in the on the diplomacy chart, right? Like the first thing is ports open, and the next thing is you get to collect the money, which Austria is doing for Bulgaria, and then the next thing is territorial passage, and what that means is that you can use the railways or the rivers to tra uh, to uh, travel or for strategic movement. Um, but you can't stop there, like you, you, or you can fly over them as well. But anyway, you can't stop in that territory because it's still a neutral nation. But you're allowed to go through there. Now, <laughs> you can almost go through there. Here, let me just find a better angle here. Uh, there we go. If the river here hadn't gone through here, then they'd be able to use that if France had been on stage three of that, but they're not. See, they're only on stage one of diplomacy there. So that's one way that you can do that. Even uh, if this had come down all the way down, like it's hard to see here, but this river goes down on the border between Bulgaria and Romania. It, it would be what separates the countries, right? Um, if, it had, it, if it had kept going, the river, and, and uh, or if Bulgaria, had uh, if the line would have been drawn along that river, then if a neutral nation is on one side of that river, then you could draw a, a path through there, because uh, they you're allowed to go through if if one side of that path is a neutral nation. It, uh, when you're talking about a river that is on a border like that, a border river, I guess you would call it, but that's not the case because it it goes through just this one section of it here goes through um romania and they're they not they don't have the diplomatic influence required to get through there yet so in other words there's no way that they can get to uh, serbia or draw a supply path to serbia so this guy in serbia let's go back here let's just zoom out a bit now now that i've showed you what i wanted to show you Okay, so this guy in Serbia couldn't go there. Long story short, I could not do that. And so um, I have to place that infantry somewhere else instead. I've already placed here, 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 here. Um, let's place him here where I was originally going to place him protecting the capital in Petrograd. There we go. So, housekeeping done. Let's talk a little bit about Japan in this period of history. So, they were an emerging nation. Before, uh, like up until the mid-1800s, they were very much a, uh, an old world country, right? Uh, feudal Japan, they were referred to as. There was a lot of clans there, you know, like kind of like the warlords in, in China, like uh, they, they, was, they had their own little areas. There wasn't really a, a national identity or a national movement. You know, like they were all Japanese, <laughs> don't get me wrong, uh, but they were not united, right? And that didn't happen until there was uh, a revolution, I believe uh, somewhere around 1870, uh, something like that, and, uh, and that established an emperor and so the emperor um, established uh, a national army and a national navy, the IJA and the IJN. And for the first time, uh, they were they they worked on a national scale. And this also started at that time 
industrialization. Before that, they were very much an agrarian society, lots of farming, right? So they started to modernize, as a lot of the world did at, at that time. They started having designs on going outside of Japan. And World War I gave them a bit of an opportunity to do that, although not as much as they would have liked. Um, in the meantime, though, like uh, the 1890s were really big for Japan. Um, they were able to gain a lot in strength and um, you know, just uh, they went from being uh, a debtor to a creditor. <laughs> you know, they were building more than they were um, than they were buying from outside countries. So they, they began to to realize a bit of wealth as well. Um, they did fight a war, uh, the Russo-Japan War. I believe that was in 1904-1905, and as a consequence, they were able to gain Korea out of that what they really wanted was was china because getting korea expanded their their um their sphere right like their sphere was just around the island of japan but by getting korea that expanded their their sphere and that took that sphere inland as far as their policy went inland china and russia and so uh they, that's what they wanted but the powers that be in America and, and in Europe uh, wouldn't allow that to happen. They, they did not want Japan going into China, um, especially the Americans. Uh, the Americans, the, China was an, a pro protectorate of the Americans. And that pissed the, the Japanese off a lot because um, they saw that as meddling in their affairs. Uh, they still did have a list of 21 demands that they imposed upon China, but would, uh, they really wanted a lot more than that. Uh, the, the 21 listed demand, demands, as far as Japan was concerned, was uh, a, a very small compromise. Uh, uh, they got a fraction of what they really wanted, which was China, right? <laughs> or a good part of China anyway. So um, what they really did in the war, I guess you could say, was they, they joined the Allies and um, they fought against the Germans. So there's a, a German presence here, let's just move in a bit, uh, in Shandong province, in China. So the only battle of the, the IJA fought was in there, it was right in the summer of 1914 and they took the Germans out of there and, and took a lot of prisoners. And then the, uh, the IJN took, a lot of, took all of the Japanese islands uh, over the next little while. And there's lots of them. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven Japanese islands as far as I can see. And that's what you're going to do. Uh, if you were an allied Japan, is you're going to take those out, and then if you if there's time at the end of the game, there probably will be. You'll get on your navy and you'll head off towards the Mediterranean, <laughs> see see if you can make a mess of things over there. And that's basically what Japan did. they did make it to the Mediterranean, and they did help protect the convoys against the um, the Austrian and the uh, German subs. And uh, they did manage to capture a few of the German submarines, which they used to develop their own submarine technology uh, after World War I. So the Treaty of Versailles was arguably the worst treaty <laughs> humanity has ever entered into. Uh, we, we know what happened in Europe after that, that led to the rise of Nazi Germany. Um, but it also led to unrest out in the uh, Pacific as well, in, in Japan and in China. So they weren't taken very seriously uh, in the Treaty of Versailles, in the talks there. The Japanese, you know, like they did, everything was asked of them in, in World War I. And still, they didn't get everything they wanted. They got to keep a few of the, the German islands, but not everything that they wanted. Of course, they didn't get China like they wanted. Probably the biggest thing, though, was that they introduced a resolution, an anti-racism uh, resolution, and most of the country supported that. But there was a few notable exceptions, uh, powerful nations that 
have racial unrest uh, internally in their countries and so the resolution was not adopted and that uh, was a real sticking point for Japan. They left there, they were not happy and um, that's not the whole reason why <laughs> why they built the the empire that they did after that but that was one of the things it, it was just obvious to them that the rest of the world wasn't taking them seriously um, they just weren't white enough <laughs> to be to be blunt about it and you know like they, they did have their own ambitions I mean that's not the only reason why they built the Navy that they did and, and um, expanded the way they did but that was uh, one of the things that they just decided was, you know what, screw it, let's just do this, right? Uh, we want to do it anyway, and uh, why should we let anybody else tell us what to do anymore? It's time for us to tell them what to do. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> getting into the game, though. So I talked a bit about the Allied uh, thing. Um, now... If you're a central powers Japan, if uh, the role at the beginning of the game or in subsequent turns goes the way of the central powers, you'll add up all the countries that Japan owns, which at the beginning of the game is 12 IPP, and you'll collect all of that. And uh, it'll be a much more interesting game on this side of the board. You can attack the Ch China if you want. Uh, you don't have to. Um, if you do, you're probably going to bring the wrath of the Americans and the British down upon you, perhaps even the French. Uh, so, you know, like that's uh, that's the, a decision that you're going to make. Uh, to be honest with you, in play testing, um, the the role is weighted the other way. So it's not that often that I've seen a central powers Japan, and I don't know um, how much of an impact you'll have in China. Uh, Bob said that uh, he did it and uh, in his playtesting and, <laughs> and Japan didn't last very long, he said. Um, he, he thought it was a bad idea. But that doesn't mean it's going to turn out the same way every time. So there's that. You can do that. You can go against Russia. You can be a thorn in the side of the British. There's a lot that you can do there. Uh, the Americans may enter the war, like if you're being really belligerent, they may enter the war early in a war against Japan, a limited war, like they won't be a part of the First World War until they d pretty much dispatch the Japanese, right? Which they can do because they will be a lot more powerful. Um, so that's the central powers, Japan. Oh, there's one other thing that I'd like to mention. Um, Adrian had asked a question on discord about uh you know like defining a little bit more um about the the chinese warlords and how that relates to japan he was wondering you know can japan just start putting units in to the warlord territories you know like just non-combat moving them over uh, to make it more difficult for the nationalist chinese um and the answer is no the what, what, one of the things that we didn't define very well, and thanks Adrian for pointing that out, like we knew in our minds what we were doing, but we didn't write everything down, right? Um, the, the China thing was actually probably only in the last year of playtesting. So uh, like we hadn't uh, defined it as well as, as the things that have been going on for a few years in our playtesting. So what you need to know about uh, the Chinese warlords is that they will are not a, a member of the central powers even though we have the central powers controlling them in this game um, they they don't belong to the central powers they will never align to the central powers uh, even though uh, central powers japan would be on the same side as them theoretically they are not allies so japan cannot share territories with them in other words for japan to enter china anywhere they would have to make a combat move so they can attack a warlord if they want but obviously that's not a very good idea right <laughs> you're, you're lessening your chances of getting points by doing that um, and the more territories you take out of the nationalists the fewer territories there are to be available to the warlords so if if it was me um just thinking about it i'd probably only go after these green territories down here because the warlords are probably not going to ha 
have those territories at the end of the game. Um, and so um, that's what I would do. I wouldn't be taking out the warlord territory. So because, you know, like even if the nationalists have taken them, because um, when you add up the score at the end of the game, you know, for the number of territories to give out points, it, it only counts for the warlords and for the nationalists. Uh, you don't add in any uh, Chinese terror or sorry, Japanese held territories into that number. So uh, you're basically taking that territory away from both of them. Um, and, you know, like it might be an idea if the uh, warlords are losing badly to take down the nationalists so that neither one of them get points. Like you'll see, you'll, you'll just play the game and, and you'll see. But uh, anyway, that's uh, a further definition of what's going on in China there. Uh, it's basically just a side hustle for Japan. And as I'm looking in there, I can see that I've left a few too many units in China from the video that I made. I'll have to clean that up before I get to the Chinese term. Anyway, so that's a, a central powers uh, Japan. You can do that, but you're, you're not welcome in there. <laughs> as far as the allies, like in this game, the allies are going to be um, uh, aligned with Japan. And so the income that you get is only half as much. Uh, whatever the number is, like at the start of the game it's 12, you're only going to collect 6 IPPs and you're going to round it down. So uh, if you make it to 13, you're still only going to collect 6. If you make it to 14 IPPs, then you're going to collect 7 IPPs for Japan. And that's for balance and also because um, they didn't need as much to do the things that they needed to do. So they wouldn't have allocated that much to their budget in Japan. Um, obviously, if they were fighting the Americans, they'd spend a lot more money, right? And, you know, so it, it pretty much uh, stands to reason. One of the things that we found in playtesting was when they were part of the Allies, they really didn't have much to do. And so um, the players that were playing Japan just sent all their money over to whoever. You know, they just lend least at all because what were they going to do with it? Um, and that's not realistic. Like Japan wouldn't have done that. I mean, when you when you read the history of it, Japan, uh, they th there's no way they would have taken their money and sent it to the European powers, right? So you can't lend lease. Um, we stopped that. Uh, that was kind of a, a cheesy game hack. So Japan is not allowed to lend lease. An ally Japan is not allowed to enter China under any circumstances. They were prevented from doing that um, in history uh, when they were an ally in Japan. So if they want to appease their allies, they will stay the heck out of China. So they cannot conduct diplomacy, um, but they can develop technology. They don't start with any technology on the board in 1914 and they only have one major factory. I suppose they could upgrade this factory, you know, with the money that they have, but you know what, technology, because they don't have a lot to do in the game, technology isn't going to help them all that much, right? Um, sure, the uh, wartime economy, you know, everybody can use money. The improved construction make it cheaper for them to build ships, but they're not gonna build that many ships even, so I wouldn't waste money upgrading the factory. But again, you know, the, you can play them any way you want. You never know, you might find something, uh, some good way of doing that, right? So uh, I think that's about it. Uh, I'm probably missing something, probably missing a lot of things, but let's just start the turn. So uh, they don't start with any money on, in 1914. They, didn't, they, they weren't part of the, of the war before this turn began, so they don't have any money. They're just going to play their turn. Um, they're not going to collect any money until the end of their turn. So next turn they'll have to have money to spend. And as I said, here, let's get to the dice roll here. They have one factory. So let's go for that wartime economy. See if we can't get them some money. They're starting at zero here. They need a seven and they get a ten. There we go. So stage one of wartime economy. Now, let's just stay over here because there is only one combat move that I could see, and that is going after these guys here. So they've got 
a couple of pre-dreadnoughts, one, two. They can do that because they're at a major naval base there with their transport. They're going to bring over these two infantry. And opposing them will be a coastal gun and a colonial infantry. So I do see another combat move here. These guys here can go three spaces, but they're at a major naval base. Uh, before I go though, um, the one thing I'd like to point out is the Japanese home country isn't just the four territories in Japan there. It's also Okinawa and Formosa. Uh, not that it, that's going to make much of a difference. I suppose it would if they were central power. So we've got three ships here not doing anything. We could go one, two three, four. We can go after that German cruiser raider. So let's just leave that here and bring down the other ships. Now that cruiser raider, he's a slippery little bugger. So the torpedo boat destroyers will have to hit at uh, one and the cruiser will have to hit at a three. And if they can't, then the cruiser raider is going to escape. So, let's get, get rolling here. That's three shots because we have three boats there. You need a three or less. And they got one. So we'll take out one of our pre-dip dreadnoughts. That means that there is only one pre-dreadnought that gets a shot at a shore bombardment. And a pre-dread is at three. Misses. Okay. So then the infantry get out and you just check, make sure there's no terrain there. Nope. No terrain. Okay. So uh, two at two and the Germans have one at two. So here we go. Um, let's do, let's do the black dice for the German. Okay. So everybody's got a hit at a two here. Those are misses. Those are misses. Only three rounds, remember. Last round. And those are misses. Okay, now in this game, because it's only three rounds and you're forced to quit, you can actually retreat from uh, an amphibious assault. So let's just put these guys over here. There we go. Now, you know what that means? That means that <laughs> that coastal gun's gonna get another shot at us. Okay, uh, so we've got those boats down there going after that cruiser raider. Okay. You know what I should have done? I should have gone after the torpedo boat destroyer as well. Too late, let's just do it. So we've got two torpedo boats and a cruiser. Look at that, two hits. Okay, so then we've got the cruiser raider at one. That's a miss. So we took out the cruiser raider. What I was saying there, should have went after this guy as well. We'll hunt him down. So that's the cruiser raider gone. Uh, you remember when we talked about getting a free diplomacy roll? Um, here, let me just show you. So Russia and Germany have free diplomacy rolls because they've both taken over a territory. There's one where you can get it where you're taking over or where you're winning uh, a naval battle as well. If you take out uh, more cruisers or and pre-dreadnoughts and dreadnoughts in a battle, than the other side. Uh, that does not include cruiser raiders. A cruiser raider is not included in that number because it's only half strength. So there's that. Now, uh, non-combat movement. Hmm. There's not a lot to do, right? Um, let's just, uh, we've got our coastal subs, but what are they gonna do? You know, like, <laughs> That torpedo boat's are gonna be able to outrun them. I mean, he's just laughing at them. 
it. So, you know what, let's just for the sake of no other reason, go one, two, we'll put one down here. This one looks like Japanese, but it's actually brown, it's Russian. The, the color is really close. Uh, I didn't, uh, I kind of thought, oh, I shouldn't have done that, but then I realized that they really don't um, clash that much in this game. Uh, so that Russian will be gone pretty quick here. I think I'm just going to leave the other one up there. Yeah, he's not hurting anybody. He's not going anywhere. Take him forever to get over to the Mediterraneans. <laughs> so we'll just leave him there. Anyway, so that's basically our turn. Uh, we get six IPPs, so here we go. Six. Shame we didn't take out that territory because we would have got. Oh, we did. We don't get a diplomacy roll. What an idiot. Yeah, I was going to say we get a diplomacy roll, but yeah, we're not going to get a diplomacy roll for the Japanese. But there is one thing that I should have talked about uh, as I'm looking around. So, over in the place units box here, uh, you'll see two Japanese infantry. And as I'm looking here, I noticed that I forgot to put this guy on for the Ottomans. We'll stick him on there too. Why not? So these Americans here, uh, they're, and the Japanese, they're listed on your build charts as reserves. Now, they stay on here. Like the Americans are not going to go on this turn. Uh, reserves wait until you go to war, the turn you go to war. So because Japan declared war on Germany this turn, they will get those two reserves and we'll put them on the board. Uh, the reason I waited till now to talk about it is because this is the first time we've had reserves in this game. It, when you play the prequel, uh, just about all the nations have reserves on their build chart. Like if you look at the 1912 setup and you don't put them on in the prequel, you wait until that nation goes to war and then on that turn you will put your reserves on. So let's just put our guy on there. There's two of them, and we've got a manpower icon for three right here. So let's just move them right there while we're at it, just because we're nice guys. And we're going to allow that General Hangane character who, who missed it to place this guy that was on the build chart. Let's just put him right here. There we go. And that's, uh, that's their elite unit. Attacks at three, defends at five. Moves one space, cost five IPP. So there we go. Um, yeah, it doesn't change. The income doesn't change. And the next nation coming up will be America, the United States of America, and then China after that. So um, there's not much that's going to happen with the Americans, but I'm still going to make a separate video from them though, because there's a lot to talk about when it comes to America in this game because there's a lot of things that they do that does not involve combat before the war begins but this video was all about Japan so take care everyone General Hand Grenade out